In this video, we're going to talk about hypersensitivity reactions. We're going to talk about blood transfusion reactions, and then we're going to talk quickly about vaccines. So let's talk about hypersensitivity reactions. This is when there's an exaggerated reaction from your immune system. And there are four types. The first type is usually what we think about when we think of allergic and atopic diseases. So your allergies, your atopic diseases, your anaphylaxis. And what happens is your B cells make too much IgE, an exaggerated amount of IgE. And your IgEs will coat your mast cells, especially your F, CE receptor. And because there's so much of them, they're all over the freaking place, right? And when an antigen comes in and binds to it, then it can cross link with another mast cell, coated with IgE. In fact, it can cross-link with a ton of them because they're just all coated with Ig. There's Ig all over the place. And when you have cross-linking, then all these mast cells can degranulate at the same time. Release a ton of things, an exaggerated amount of things. You release histamine. You get that massive vasodilation, right? If someone has like a giant peanut allergy and they have a swollen lip or tongue or throat. So massive amounts of histamine and you know, that, that can trigger your arachnidonic pathway and release your leukotrienes, prostaglandins, leukotrienes in particular, which cause a ton of things, in, including smooth muscle contraction, so you can get that tightness on your chest when you see things like allergies or allergic reactions. And leukotrienes also attract, chemotactically, leukocytes, right? Hopefully you haven't forgotten that. And your leukocytes can release cytokines, cause tissue damage, just make things worse. They want you to know that we can break up hypersensitivity one reactions into the acute phase, which is basically your mast cells degranulating. So right, mast cells. And after they degranulate and release all these factors, then you have your late phase, where your leukocytes come in, take some time, but when they come in, they can release your cytokines. Release your cytokines. So that's type one hypersensitivity reaction. Let's talk about type two. This is when you have antibodies that attack some sort of cell antigen. So an antibody that attacks cell antigen. So we'll just say you have a little cell with an antigen, an uh, innocent little antigen that doesn't that isn't causing you any problems, but for some reason your body freaks out and attacks this. Creates a bunch of antibodies that attack this and coats this and your macrophages will see it coated and when it sees antibodies coating something it says hey that's something i should phagocytose phagocytose it's attacking something it must be foreign must be dangerous even if it's not and so your macrophages will come in and destroy it macrophages or sometimes your complements will destroy or your natural killers will see this and destroy it. any way you cut it Antibodies are attacking your cell antigens and it's causing destruction of whatever that is, whether it's good or bad, often exaggerated. That's type two. Type three is an antibody against an antigen. And you might be saying, well, what's the difference? Well, here is not being attacked, instead, it's forming this complex, we call this an immune complex. And it isn't being attacked in the bloodstream, although it can be. Instead, it circulates around and deposits in a tissue, deposits in a tissue. And once it deposits in a tissue, once it settles down, then your body sees it and attacks it. So I'll say deposits, attracts leukocytes, Complements, which comes in, destroys your tissue, causes inflammation, and you can get 
destruction. Uh, example of this is you can have immune complexes that circulate around your body and then deposit into your kidneys. And your body will go and attack your kidneys, destroy your kidneys. You get nephritis. Okay, you get nephritis. Now, some other examples of type 3 hypersensitivity reaction they want you to know is the difference between serum sickness and Arthur reaction. The heck is that? Serum sickness occurs when you give a drug and your body sees that and for whatever reason freaks out, attacks it. Will make B cells will make antibodies to attack the antigens on that drug. And it takes a while, so it takes about five plus days. But eventually it will attack it, form immune complexes, give you that type 3 hypersensitive sensitivity reaction. Arthur's reaction, on the other hand, is preformed antibodies against that antigen and causes local attack. The common example is you inject a drug intramuscularly and you have preformed antibodies in that area that attack makes it swell up, immediate reaction. Immediate reaction. So all right, immediate. Immediate because you have preformed antibodies, you don't have to wait for your B cells to make new ones. So those are the two types and they want you to be able to kind of distinguish between the two. So we talked about hypersensitivity reaction, type one, two, three. The last one is type four. Type 4. And type 4 is sometimes called delayed, sometimes called antibody independent. It doesn't use antibodies. It's unique in that way. The other three use antibodies. We use IgE here. We use antibodies to attack antigens here. Again, over here. So type 4 is unique that it doesn't use antibodies. It is antibody independent. What happens is the Th1 helper cells gets exposed to an antigen. Gets exposed to an antigen. And it gets primed. It gets primed. Sorry, primed. And when it's exposed again, it will trigger an attack. It will either pull in your macrophages or your CD8, and it will attack and destroy whatever it is, whether good or bad. And that's type four hypersensitivity reaction. Now there's some examples you should know. PPD test is one of them. If you're exposed to tuberculosis and your Th1 cells are primed, and then the next time you're exposed again via the PPD test, when they inject the antigen in your skin, you will attack it, right? So you get this little swelling, this redness, and that's your PPD test. Contact dermatitis is another one. Like nickel, a lot of people have a reaction to nickel. They wear nickel and then the next time they wear they have an inflammation. Or um, was it poison ivy? Poison ivy is another one. So these are all examples. There's one more graft versus host disease. It's a type 4 hypersensitive reaction, which we talked about in a previous video. Okay? I think that's all I want to talk about for hypersensitivity reaction. Let's talk about blood reactions. Blood reactions. Blood transfusions occur all the time, and sometimes you can have a reaction to it. There are many different types of blood transfusion reaction. They want you to be able to pick up the type right from the history alone. There are non-hemolytic types where the blood cells aren't dying, you're just having some reaction towards it. And these are acute, less than six hours, and there's no real treatment, you just support them and usually they'll do all right. They'll do all right. The first one is called febrile reaction. What do you this is a type two hypersensitivity reaction. So you have antibodies that are kind of coating and attacking these antigens. You get fevers and chills. That's what gives it the name febrile reaction. But usually it goes away with supportive measures. The patient does all right. <clears throat> you can have transfusion related lung injury. It's a reaction that involves your lungs. So you'll have the fevers, you'll have the chills, but you also have respiratory distress, shortness of breath. You do a chest x-ray, there's a whiteout. 
to involve the lungs. <clears throat> if you see a patient that has been given blood, has respiratory distress, fevers, chills, and you look at the answer choices and one of them is freaking transfusion related lung injury, it's probably that one, all right? It's probably that one, just judging by the name alone. And then the last case of not hemolytic anemia is going to be allergic reaction. We talked about this when we talked about IgA deficiency, right? If you are deficient in IgA and someone gives you blood full of IgA, you're going to have a reaction to it, an allergic reaction to it. Your body's not used to all that IgA. So this is seen in IgA deficiency. And allergic reactions will show up like allergic reactions. You get pruritus, you get anaphylaxis. So right, pruritus, anaphylaxis shouldn't be too hard to pick up on the question stem. The trick question on the other hand is what does this show up on? Is what shows up on labs. What shows up on labs is normal LDH and bilirubin. Because you're attacking IgA. You're not attacking the red blood cells. You're not destroying red blood cells. You're not increasing bilirubin. You're attacking the IgA. Remember this is not hemolytic, right? You're attacking the IgA not your red blood cells. You can have hemolytic anemia. Hemolytic, and there are two types. There's minor hemolytic reaction. And these affect the minor proteins in your blood, not your ABO, but your minor ones like your Kel, your Lewis, your Duffy, and your RH. Okay, shows up with delayed jaundice because it takes a while and it's not very major. So you get jaundice a little bit later on. And then a slow rise in hematocrit. If you give someone blood, you uh, expect your hematocrit to rise, right? You're giving them blood. So if you give them blood, then their hematocrit's not rising like it should because it's getting destroyed. It's starting to get jaundice a little bit later. You're thinking of minor hemolytic anemia due to uh, attack on Kel, Lewis, Duffy, RH, all that good stuff. Major hemolytic anemia is gonna be an attack on your ABO. So ABO incompatibility. That's a big deal. So you're gonna have much earlier onset of Hondas. You're gonna have pain. You're gonna have hemoglobin neuria, or your red blood cells are dying. You're peeing it out. Your blood, your your urine's red. Your labs are gonna show increased LDH, bilirubin, just full-on hemolysis. Your red blood cells are getting destroyed. All right, that's the worst thing that can happen. Major ABO incompatibility. It usually doesn't happen anymore because we we type and cross, but it can. It can. There's some minor blood transfusion reactions that you should know, like citrate toxi toxicity. Citrate is an anticoagulant that they put in blood so your blood doesn't clot. Your blood doesn't clot. And if you put too much blood, and if you give too much blood to a patient, then you'll give too much citrate to a patient. And citrate binds calcium and magnesium. So it binds that and then now the patient has hypocalcium, hypomagnesium. What does low calcium show up as? It can show up as tetanus, all right? It shows up as tetanus. So can you think of how they might ask this in a step-like question? So patient was in a vehicle accident, they're bleeding out, you give them four units of blood, suddenly they develop tetanus, all right? They're spazzing out. Citrate toxicity. Also, when you give red blood cells, red blood cells can die and leak potassium. Too much potassium or too little potassium, but too much potassium can cause arrhythmias. Can you think about how they might ask that? Someone's bleeding now, you give them four units, and then, I don't know, they get going to V-fib. What happened? Too much potassium. Something important you should just kind of keep in the back of your mind, as well as knowing this is general thing, okay? The history will give it away, for sure, for sure. Last but not least, let's talk about vaccines. Vaccines help us elicit an immune response without having to expose yourself to really dangerous bacteria, right? So we can give live vaccines, which contain live bacteria, but they've lost its pathogen ability. But your body, but your body will respond to it like it is in an infection. So your B cells will activate, your T cells will activate, that's your humoral and your cellular response, and we'll attack it and create a long 
lasting immune response. Long lasting immune response. Now there are some downsides to it. Bacteria are very, very tricky organisms. They can undergo cellular recombination, genetic recombination, and they can actually revert back to its pathogenic form. So they can revert to pathogenic form. A lot of uh, controversy about giving live polio vaccine. We give it, it's lost its pathogenic ability. We think all is well, but sometimes it can revert, very rarely it can revert back to its pathogen state and cause polio. So we avoid it in pregnant women, we avoid it in the immunocompromised. Okay, the one exception, live vaccines like MMR, varicella, we give to HIV patients if their CD4 is over 200. So we weighed the risk and benefits and we said better to give them if their CD4 is over 200. All right. If you don't want to do live vaccines, we can give inactivated or killed, killed bacteria. And so they're still exposed to some of those proteins and antigens, but they're, they're dead, right? They're not going to revert back to their old form. Now your body will know it's dead and won't mount the same strong immune response it did before. Here you only get your B cells to mount an uh, immune response. It makes antibodies against it. So, so it's safer, but the bad thing is that there is a weaker response. You might need boosters. You might need boosters. So if you're talking about a vaccine that needs boosters, you're talking about inactivated, killed vaccines. You need boosters to kind of remount that response because it gets weaker over time. Now our last talk will be on immunity. Active and passive immunity. Vaccines give you active immunity. Your cells are actively making antibodies, actively mounting a response, actively trying to fight whatever this pathogen is. Uh, so I'll just write actively doing stuff. <laughs> actively doing stuff. Again, this is good. These last longer. Passive immunity is when you give someone the antibodies. You don't let your own body make the antibodies, you just give it to them. You give it to them and that can destroy whatever you want to destroy. The downside is because your body isn't actively mounting a response, actively making new cells, actively making antibodies, as soon as these antibodies are gone, you don't have that immunity anymore, right? So this is short lasting. And goes away when those antibodies go away. The classic example, uh, pregnant women will pass IgG to their baby. And for the time that they have that anti those IgG antibodies, they are protected. But after six months when those antibodies are gone, they don't have lasting active immunity. Those antibodies are gone, they don't have any immunity, they're exposed, okay? Those are, so that's hypersensitivity reaction, that's blood reaction, vaccines, and active and passive immunity. Hope you enjoyed the video, thanks.